Good morning, New Hope. How's everybody doing this morning? This is so great. It is such an honor to be here with you guys. We feel like God just really breathed on our time together this weekend at, at, a, at a live conference. And um, we're just trusting. You know, I, listen, you have your work cut out for you because, man, the 8 o'clock service this morning, they were on fire. I mean, they were easy to preach to. I know this may shock some, but listen, we had a move of God this morning. So I'm just saying, if this service is bad, it's your fault, not mine. No, I'm kidding. And so uh, thank God for those who came so early, and I do mean early, this morning. Um, let's go. I want to go straight to the scripture this morning, and then I'll uh, do a couple of things in terms of introduction. But I want to read the scriptures this morning. So uh, Luke chapter 11 is where uh, we want to start. Luke chapter 11, uh, verses 5 through 8. So it'll be on the screen for you. You can turn there. Luke chapter 11, starting at verse 5, it says this, And he said to them, he being Jesus, Which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, Your friend, 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 lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me on this journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Don't trouble me. My door is shut. And my kids are asleep. I cannot rise and give to you. Verse 8 says, I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, everybody say persistence, he will rise and give him as many loaves of bread as he, as he needs. If you have your Bibles, you can skip over about seven chapters to Luke chapter 18 verses 1 through 8. Still Jesus talking here. Then he spoke in a parable. Everybody say parable. To them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Saying there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Self, though I do not fear God, nor regard man, yet because this widow is bothering me, troubling me, I'll avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me, or she just wears me out. Verse 6, then the Lord says, hear what the unjust judge said, and shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless... When the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? By your hands, many right where you sit. Father, we thank you so much for your presence in this place. We thank you that you are alive and your word is alive. It is active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. We pray that you would speak to us this morning and cause us to look a little bit more like your Son, Jesus in Jesus' name, we pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, worship team. I'll call you back up at the end. Help me out. It is an honor and a privilege to be with you in icy Urbandale uh, this morning. I was telling the 8 o'clock service, it's cold in Colorado, but this is a whole nother level of cold. This is the kind of cold that reaches through your jacket, underneath your shirt, and just goes to your bone and shakes you a little bit. Um, I don't know if y'all realize that or not. It's cold in Colorado, but it's a, it's a dry cold. It's like, you know, now's nice powdery snow. This kind of cold, I almost slip about 12 times throughout this weekend. I'm like, what is going on? I didn't even see anything. That ice will sneak up on you in Iowa. So blessings to everybody who's never fallen or tripped or hasn't broken a hip, a knee, a neck or an elbow uh, before, but it is an honor. It's my first time in uh, Des Moines, first time in the great state of Iowa. So uh, this is exciting for me. People are a lot nicer than what I thought they were going to be. I don't know. Mid I don't know wherever we are in the country. Sometimes I'm geographically challenged, but I just didn't expect it. I'm from the south, so I hail from southwest Louisiana, uh, where all the good food in the country is. Amen. And uh, lots of humidity, similar to this, but just not this cold. But uh, it's a real blessing to be here. You know, uh, this morning as I was praying and just even thinking about the service and just kind of seeing the culture that is in this house, I was reminded of Psalm, I believe it's 
Psalm 145, uh, Psalm 145, it says that, and one generation will say to another generation. It says, I will exalt you, my God and King, and I'll praise your name forever, Psalm 145. But then it goes on to say, and one generation will speak of the works of God to the next generation. And I love what God seems to be knitting together and what God seems to be putting some momentum on in this church where it is truly a multi-generational move of God that God has wanted to. And you know, this is prophetic of the end times because it does say in Malachi at the end of the Old Testament that God in the last days the, the prophetic word is that God will return the hearts of the fathers back to the sons and turning sons back to fathers and that's not just in physical families but that's also spiritual so whenever that begins happening in our churches we know that God is up to something. There's an outpouring there's, that is coming. There are more souls to be saved. There are more lives to be transformed. And how does it feel, church, to be right in the middle of what God is doing? Come on, somebody. You're blessed people. And I realize that that does not just happen uh, sort of like in, in happenstance. You see what I'm saying? God has sent you the best of the best. I call them the dynamic duo. I'm sure I'm not the first to do so, but man, pastors Luke and, and Zach, aren't they amazing? Aren't they just gifts from Jesus? They pastor your young people so well. They pour into them, the local high schools. I'm just amazed at even some of the stories that we were just sharing this weekend. My wife and I were in youth ministry for about 12 and a half years. And, and so it's such a blessing to see people who are serious about this generation and impacting them and loving them well and empowering them. But that does not happen without some models that go before and some empowering. And so I just want to take a moment to honor Pastor Jeff and Pastor James. Can we just honor your senior pastors, your founding pastor? Your... That's a big deal. <clears throat> That's a really big deal. So thank you for your hearts for shepherding. Pastor <laughs> Jeff was telling this morning, I just love it because I love senior pastors who know their flock. He's like, guys, are we sure that those lights are going to be okay? Because so-and-so has headaches and, you know, we don't want her headache to just increase during the service today because he knows his people. You've got a shepherd here that God has raised up and multiple shepherds. Come on, give God some praise. That's a blessing. It takes shepherds to raise up other shepherds. I want to introduce you to my family uh, this morning just by way of picture. That is, uh, so that is my wife, Octavia. March will be 10 years, a whole decade, uh, that we have been loving each other, serving alongside one another. So that's my wife, Octavia. Uh, she travels and speaks uh, additionally with me many times, but she's also a, a, a psychotherapist, so she keeps my mind right, okay? And, uh, and she's helping people in our community. It is it's so powerful to see the prophetic gifting that's on her life sort of merge into the uh, mental health arena, and uh, it's such a blessing. She meets people on a weekly basis, especially those on the autism spectrum, and it's so powerful taking the Word of God and those principles and translating it into culture, and so she's doing a phenomenal job at that. Uh, who is right in front of her is my seven-year-old. She just turned seven three days ago. Her name is Ryan Nicole, and then I have a four-year-old, just girls everywhere, just girls, 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 you know? And so that is Nora. She sent me a video this morning telling me that she misses me and that she was talking to me in her sleep last night. Mm. All the dads of girls just say, mm. All the dads of teenage girls still say, mm. I'm just believing that it's just going to be the same. All the dads of 25 and 30-year-old girls just say, mm. I just imagine she's just always going to be my baby girl. These, these two girls. And um, we got a third one on the way. Come on, somebody. We just found out. And uh, I just looked at my wife. I'm like, how did this happen? She's like, boy, you know how this happened. Uh, see, our first two girls, we weren't trying for them. They just kind of showed up. And so we were trying to get pregnant for like four weeks. And then we thought, oh, let's just, you know, delay this because this year we're going to be birthing a brand new church in Colorado Springs called Zeal Church, okay? in September, and so I guess we figured, you know, we'll birth the church, why not birth the child as well? We'd actually stop because my wife was like, I am not trying to be big and pregnant on lunch day, you know? And, and so we stopped, and then about a month later, it was like, surprise, you're pregnant, and so y'all pray for a boy. 
I'm not kidding. I'm like, for real, for real. I really need you to pray <laughs> for, for, for y'all think I'm joking. I've literally sought the Lord in, you know, sackcloth and ashes and prayer, you know. I love my girls, and if we get a third girl, it will just have another, yet another princess. But I'm surrounded by Barbie dolls, and, um, but listen, it's a new season because my, my girls just discovered Black Panther. Come on, somebody. Wakanda forever. <laughs> And, and I have, a, somebody gave me a Black Panther doll. I don't just play with dolls. But I, somebody said it's kind of like a gift in the mail. And so now for the first time, this is a shift in the Cormier household. I actually got to be a male doll whenever we were playing because normally I'm like this, you know, little Barbie doll and we're going to school. I travel with Barbies in my suitcase. It's super awkward as I'm going through TSA because it's like four or five <laughs> Barbie dolls. And the thing has to open up and they're like, what is this grown black man doing with this you know, just, and I'm like no I have girl this isn't a hobby of mine I love my kids so I love dolls you know and so um I'm so thankful for my family and that we get to do this uh together it was about just over a year ago uh that we had stepped down we actually resigned our position at the church that we have been working several years and uh, we felt like God was calling us into this full-time travel season as a family. And then about six months into that season, the Lord called us into church planting. And now, we're, so there's multiple things going on, and we are so blessed. So here's what I need from you. Pray for us, like for real. Uh, and, and, pray, and, and that will take on a new meaning after the message this morning, because I really mean it. Um, in terms of praying for Zeal Church. Colorado Springs, if you have family, friends in that area, uh, please let them know. So jazealchurch.com, we'll have a part-time internship for young adults as well. And so Zeal Church coming September because we just believe that there's a revival that God wants to bring. We just believe that we need churches that are full of the Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody. Full of the presence of God, full of the life of God, and uh, intentionally uh, contending for a move of God in cities all over the nation. And uh, we're going to be one of the churches that are doing that in Colorado Springs. So um, this morning, I want us to jump right into, uh, right into the scriptures. Here's, here's, what, what, here's what's interesting about the text that I just read in the book of Luke. Luke being the brilliant physician that he was, he was also a bit of a teacher. He's very intentional about the words that he uses as he is writing out his gospel. And as he starts and he writes to us in Luke chapter 11, he is telling the story of a moment where Jesus is speaking to a gathering of people, to a crowd, and though these two parables are separated by about seven chapters, most commentators and theologians would agree that those two stories were told back to back, like Jesus told the first one, and though Luke doesn't go right into it, whenever Jesus presented it live, he went right into that second parable, and the two are linked, so the thematic elements of these two parables are fused together, and Jesus is really trying to get a point across. Now, it's essential for us to understand what a parable is and what it is not. So parables uh, were not just something, a way in which Jesus started teaching in the New Testament. Parables are dated way back before Jesus even came on the scene. Thousands upon thousands of years ago, and they find their roots in Jewish cultures. So some of the best teachers historically were Jewish rabbis, and they would use this idea of the this Hebrew word mashal, which translates to parables, and it's literally where you tell one story in order to reveal truths that are hidden in the story that you are telling. Does that make sense, everyone? And so, so Jesus being the Jewish teacher that he was and one of the most brilliant minds and the best teacher who ever lived, whenever he really wanted to get a point across, he'd tell one parable. And if it seemed like they weren't understanding, he'd come back and bow, hit him with a second parable just to make sure that he's driving the message home. Does that make sense, everybody? And so, so this idea of parables, that was the Hebrew mindset of a parable. And then in the Greek, we get the Greek word parabole. And in the Greek mindset of a parable, the idea is um, it, it's something that you cast alongside something else to strengthen it. So Jesus has a truth that he wants to reveal. And he takes a parable and he casts it alongside the parable to make sure that the message goes deep. 
and that there is an understanding that takes place for everyone who is listening. He is brilliant in his teaching style. Now, again, these two parables arguably were told in the same setting, and Jesus used them as a shadow of a deep substance. Parables were mostly used to reveal the ways of God to the people of God. Let us never get the message twisted. God is limitless. <clears throat> he is boundaryless. He is borderless. To ever think that you will reach a place where you can reduce God down to your level of understanding, you are no longer dealing, thinking, or interacting with the uncreated God of the universe because he'll never be relegated to your limited understanding. He supersedes, that's why scripture says his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are so much more lofty than our thoughts. So it is important that anytime we come to God, we realize that we're dealing with the supernatural being. We are dealing with one who is altogether different from anyone or anything we have ever experienced in our natural lives. He is Yahweh El Shaddai Elohim, the great God, the self-sufficient God, the God who needs neither you nor I, the God who says when I get ready to seek counsel, I reach down into the depths of who I am and I consult myself. Woo! You look outside of you when you need advice. He looks inside. He says, self, what do you want to do? <laughs> How are we going to handle this situation? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so as Jesus came as the great revealer of the nature and the character of God, he would use parables to express different aspects, different characteristics of this great God. But he also taught us how we are to relate to this great God because he came from God. He was God. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God, right? And, 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 and so as John goes on to tell us, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God, and then eventually the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld him. We beheld the glory of God, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, the writer John would tell us. And so he tells us, this is how you are to relate to my Father. I know him best, so trust me on this, guys. <laughs> Take my word for it. I'll show you how to relate to my to my father. And so he begins his parable. Which of you? And whenever he states this question, it's important to understand that this is a realistic scenario that could, it was a probable scenario that would actually happen. And he says, which of you, in Luke chapter 11, verse 5, which of you would have a friend and then go to that friend at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves because somebody showed up at my house and I didn't have any extra. Now, this never happened at my mom's house. I can't even relate to this because we always had extra food. I grew up in the South. I grew up a church kid. We always fed people. My mom still cooks for like the whole church, like all of them every other Sunday. She feeds all the youth. I mean, it's crazy. Thanksgiving's at my house. I mean, it's like 106 people. I'm not even kidding. There's like buffet style. You would literally think you're at the local buffet. I mean, and it is good. Come on, somebody. I like to eat. And uh, so, so it, it, Jesus starts this off and he says, which of you, if you have a friend come to you at midnight, and then you go to your friend, and then you, you, you knock on that friend's door, and you ask him to borrow something in the middle of the night. Now, it, it's important to understand this, this friend who's knocking on the door, if you're that friend, knocking on the door in the middle of the night, you've got to understand the context. Jewish people lived in such close proximity to one another that everybody would hear. So it's not like, oh, somebody's at my neighbor's house and I'm in a deep sleep. It's like you're knocking on the neighbor's door and you're literally waking up the whole entire neighborhood. Like, what's wrong with you? And then he says, which of you, if, if you went and you knocked on the friend's door and you asked him for loaves of bread because somebody showed up at your house, which of you would respond to that friend and say, uh, go away, my kids are asleep, it's late, come back another day. There would be an audible, like, 
Because in Jewish culture, hospitality is everything. Nobody ever turns anybody away. It doesn't matter if you're inconvenienced or, no, no, it's like that would be so shameful. And nobody would do it knowing that the whole neighborhood is listening. You see what I'm saying? Because everybody's listening to this conversation. Hey, friend, let me in. No, everybody be like, oh, clutch my pearls. You know, like everybody's like, what is happening? And so Jesus is like, so he's got everybody's attention because he's telling this, this realistic scenario, but the response is super unrealistic it'd be like oh you know it's like your neighbor like cutting the grass at 3 a.m in the morning like who does that you whack job like get out you know what i'm saying like nobody would do that and so 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 everybody responds they're appalled they're shocked because hospitality is of utmost importance so he grasps their attention and then he goes on to on to tell them verse 8 i say to you though he may not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he'll rise and give him however many loaves of bread that he's asking for. Three, four, five, what you need? I got you, seven, 10, 12, here we are. Because of his persistence. And then Jesus goes right out of that story, right into the next one, where he says, hey, men should always pray and not lose heart. Really going to the, to, the, to, the, to the centerpiece of what he's trying to communicate. He's so good. And this idea of perseverance, because of the friends, perseverance, that word perseverance actually translated means shamelessness. It's a lack of sensitivity to what is proper. You know, there are some times and some seasons whenever you're really seeking the heart of God about something, and I can show you this all through scripture, where it's like, I don't care about protocol. I don't care what everybody else is doing. I have got to get to the presence of God. I have got to get to the heart of God. And so Jesus is saying, because of this person's persistence, their lack of uh, of protocol, you see what I'm saying? That neighbor has got to receive respond to them but I believe that it goes even a little bit deeper than this see this word captures most of the idea that Jesus was communicating but really it wasn't shamelessness it was this idea of tenacity bold perseverance See, Jewish scholars would suggest this, that the actual idea that's being communicated is this Hebrew word it's called chutzpah. and it means this it means it means it means brazen tenacity, bold perseverance. See, here's the idea of what Jesus was saying. There's a reward that comes with persistence. There is a promise that's reserved for the persistent. Those who pray with chutzpah receive things that those who don't pray with it don't get. And it's not because God loves them any less. It's just, hey, here is the, remember he's showing us, here's the protocol of how to relate to my father best. And there's something about the heart of God that looks at our persistence, that looks at our continual showing up, that moves his heart by way of response. So in Luke 18, Jesus starts that second parable. And he says, hey, I just want you to know, men, women, you should always pray and never give up. Don't ever grow weary don't ever become faint don't ever lose heart don't become discouraged don't ever give up see the second parable he tells a story of a widow this widow has been wronged by somebody in the community the protocol was to go to the judge and the judge's job was the exact judgment or justice on the person who created or who committed the criminal offense but this judge is no good He is a scoundrel. He does not love justice. He does not love God. Neither does he fear God. So this widow shows up. Hey, somebody's wronged me. And the judge is like, okay, whatever. Like, keep him. <laughs> like, he's scrolling through his social media. And, and she's like, nope, nope, nope. He's like, come back tomorrow. She's like, okay. So tomorrow she comes back. She actually shows up. And then she keeps showing up over and over and over again. And Jesus goes on to say, it's not even that that judge loves God, loves people, respects justice, fears God. But just because of the annoyance 
that she possesses because she's so passionate about receiving what she is justly due and owed, he'll respond and he'll give her justice. And I find it interesting that he goes on to say because of her continual coming, this woman, she possesses the very same thing that Jesus says men women ought to pray always and never give up. The Greek word there is inkakeo. It means grow weary, become faint, lose heart. He says, don't be like, like do the opposite of that. This woman demonstrates the complete opposite of inkakeo, of giving up. And then he goes on to say, will he really find faith on the earth? My question to you this morning is, will he find faith on the inside of you? See, there's something about faith that says, though I cannot see it in the natural, I know what God has spoken. And church, may it never be that we as a body of believers, those of us who claim to know Jesus, that we would ever fall into the category of being moved and driven by what we see in the natural. We are a supernatural people. Your citizenship is not here on the earth. Your citizenship is lodged behind the veil in heaven, covered with blood on the other side of the cross. We are supernatural just by our very design. We have the blood of Jesus pulsating through our veins. We are not normal. We are not natural. We are sons and daughters of a different realm. This is not just pithy statements to make you feel better about yourself. This isn't a self-help talk. This is a preached message that comes from the word of God because sometimes we need a wake-up call because we actually forget who we are. We are sons and daughters of the living God. We carry within us the power of God. We've got the whole resource of heaven and the whole word of God in our very belly, which is why Jesus says, he who believes on me out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. The way you access those rivers is through prayer. And when you try to do it without, you'll be powerless. Stale, dry, and devoid of the presence of God. Oh, may it never be, Jesus. May it never be. You see, you've got to understand, I grew up in a praying household. Some of my earliest memories are literally my mom praying, both in English and in tongues. I didn't even know what it was. She's called, you know, and I'm just like, oh, I guess every mom prays like this. I don't know, but, but I found out later in life it's very abnormal. And so, I mean, I go to sleep to her praying. I wake up to her praying. I, I wake up and she's like praying in my room. I'm like, what are you doing, mom? I'm just trying to go to sleep. And she's like, God, use it for your glory. And I'm just like, okay, whatever, you know. I'm trying to go to sleep. Uh, to this day, I can sleep with any amount of noise uh, going on because I just I was just conditioned. You see what I'm saying? My dad led me to the Lord in our living room at five years old. He's always been a deacon in the church. My mom's always been a Sunday school teacher and an intercessor. And so that was just the environment that I grew up in. So I grew up so believing the power of prayer. But it wasn't until I experienced it for myself and began to have a relationship with God via prayer that it was like, wow, anything could happen. And great faith began rising up on the inside. I want to speak to every parent in this room right now. What are your children learning from you about prayer? That's not an indictment, it's just an encouragement. What will they say about you? What will they say about your prayer life 10 years from now? Someone was asking me recently about teaching our children to pray. I have, like I said, Nora Grace, she's four years old, and then I have a seven-year-old, Ryan, and um, it's funny, at the beginning of each, of each year, we, we engage together in a season of fasting. This year, I went a little bit longer, but just kind of called them, so 21 days prayer and fasting, and so we, we have our children fast, too. I'm like, listen, every, if we, are we all about to just go through this together? You know what I'm saying? And so, um, so for 20, and every year we tell the girls, like in January, like, eat up, girls, because, uh, you know, have all the chocolates you want. And so they fast for 21 days. They, they fast sweets, and they're like, they're very serious about it. But every year we tell them it's like a brand new message, and they're like, ah! 
I'm not kidding. Like that's literally, the, it's, that's not an exaggeration. I have it recorded on my Instagram. You can go and look it up on my story highlights every single year. So they're like, ah, you know, I think that's, I mean, that's literally like what our flesh says whenever we it's like, ah, you know, it's like the wicked witch, you know, just, you know, and so, so that's what the, because like, that's what, that's part of fasting. It's, you know, your flesh dying. I don't want to die. And so, so, but we've really tried to model for them, like, hey, it's not just about like not you not having all your chocolates and your frozen yogurt and all these different things. It's about setting aside a time and we seek God together and modeling prayer for them. And so they've heard us pray so much. And what's really cool is whenever you begin to hear the language of prayer in your children, and so Nora, four years old, she's in preschool, she's been praying. She's been praying for a classmate, his name is Jamo. He goes by Jamo, his name is Jameson. And little Jameson, he has a little bit of autism, so he's on the autism, uh, on the autism spectrum. But then also he's got some physical things to where he's about two grades behind. So Jamo is supposed to be like in first or second grade, but he's actually still in preschool. And the major piece that's holding him back are some auditory functions. So he needs to be able to say a few more things in order for him to move on. And so my four-year-old Nora, so sweet, she, that's the one who sent me the video this morning, and she said, um, so we've been praying like at night for Jamo, and so she's heard Octavia pray so much, that's my wife, like, Lord, we just speak a release to Jamo's uh, vocal cords, and we speak in the name of J and so just like multiple times throughout the fast, Nora's like, Lord, the vocal cords, cords of the vocal, vocal cords, Lord, loosen in Jesus' name for Jamo, but she's like praying, now the child probably don't even know what vocal cords are, much less how to spell vocal cords, you know, where are your vocal cords, I don't know. But she's been trained in the way of prayer. And so about day 17 or so into this 21 days of prayer and fasting, the, the person from the district who comes and evaluates JMO every six months or so, whatever the rotation is, came and, and, and the teacher actually sent this video to us because once the, it, the teacher came to evaluate, for the first time, Jameson was actually able to say the words that he needed to say. There's tears, there's, Nora was hugging him and the teacher was like, and the teacher was it's like, Nora, you've been praying for JMO, right? And she's like, yes. And JMO's hugging her and she's hugging JMO. And then the, the, the representative from the district is like, you'll be able to go on to kindergarten this coming year. And so it's this big deal. But what is that? Why does it? Because for her, she knows God hears me. And even the language and the words that she's using aren't necessarily her own. Because everything starts off as an echo before you get your own voice. That's a whole another message. But she's echoing the prayers of what she's heard mom and dad pray. And I'm just wondering if there's something generational that God is wanting to hand down through you. And this starts at whatever season of life. Here's what you've got to understand. Your prayers are deathless. Prayers outlive the person who prayed them. Can you not see that in scripture? Prayers that were prayed in the Old Testament, prophets, and then, and then the fulfillment of that prayer long after they died, and God making good because God's commitment is to his word. And when you pray his word, it doesn't matter if you die, it doesn't matter if you have gone on, God makes good on every promise, and his loyalty, he is fiercely loyal to his own word. Come on, somebody. And so, so the idea here, the idea here is that Jesus is, is talking about this, this, this level, this, this chutzpah, this, all right, I'm going to pray with a little bit of, of, of tenacity. I'm going to pray with a little bit of, I shall not be moved. And so I want to give you some, some, some examples from scripture of people who, who, who pray and who, who possess this, this chutzpah that I'm, that I'm talking about. Luke chapter 5 and 20, you can just jot these down. They're not going to be on the screen. We'll kind of blow through these. Luke 5 and 20 says, when he saw their faith, he said to them, man, your sins are forgiven you. This was the paralytic who was lowered through the roof and was healed, but he saw the, 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 the brazen tenacity of his friends. Like Jesus is here. He's in the house. The house is full cut a hole in the roof come on you need a few friends who are like cut a hole in the roof uh, but but i can't like there's a, no. cut the hole in the roof we can do this by god's grace 
Luke 8, 48, and he said to her daughter, be of good cheer, your faith has made you well, go in peace. This was the woman who had been struggling with the issues of, issue of blood, bleeding for years and years and years. There was something on the inside of her that said, I don't care about protocol, I don't care about all these other people. There's something on the inside that says, if I can just get to Jesus, I believe that Jesus is looking at that same thing in our prayer lives, where you say, if I can just touch heaven with my prayers, I know that God's gonna do something. Luke 7 and 50, then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. This was the woman with the alabaster box, arguably Mary, who broke her, her alabaster box and poured it at the feet of Jesus. There was something that said, you know, I know no one else would sort of waste this very, very, very expensive oil, but the chutzpah on the inside of her said, I don't care what everybody else is doing. Are you kidding me? I've got to get to Jesus. I've got to get to his presence. I've got to get before him. He has the answers that I need. And by the way, everything that you are searching for, no matter where you are in your walk with God, if you are far from God or close with him, I want to remind some and inform others that everything you seek, everything that your heart aches for is found in the presence of Jesus himself. And to search for it anywhere else is a, is a boring, a wasteless journey, and it will leave you futile. It is a futile attempt to fulfill something on the inside of you that only Jesus has for you. The good thing is he loves you so much. It'll keep just extending his hand to you. How many of you know that to be true in your own life? Thank God for his amazing, amazing grace. Matthew 15, 28. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Luke 18, 42. Then Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And this was a context where this guy who had been blind and people were like, just chill out. Like, just, just calm down. Like, just, you're doing too much. <laughs> you're just doing the most. Sit down. But he pressed past the crowds and he pressed past status quo. And he said, I've just got to get, he possessed that thing on the inside of him, that Jewish word, that chutzpah. As it relates to the way of prayer, I'm just wondering where you are in that, in that reality, in that expression. You know, there's something about prayer that can seem mystical or difficult or like we all like to pretend like we have a stronger prayer life than we actually do. You know, I get it, whatever. And so, but, but I wonder, <clears throat> it was some years ago I was in, I was in a part of this missions program called YWAM, Youth with the Mission, and travel Calcutta, India, work with Sisters of Charity, Mother Teresa, all these different things in Africa and just different parts of the world. And, and I remember being there in that season at YWAM, going through some discipleship training, and it, it was taught to us that there's something that God loves in us. He loves us, but what he really appreciates, values, and what brings him pleasure is that whenever we're humble before the Lord. And then they begin to unpack this idea of what does it mean to be humble? Humility is actually a willingness to be known for who you really are. So when we come into God's presence or we come around God's people, <clears throat> God's expectation is that you be who you really are. That you not pretend, that you not try to be something that you're not because you understand and know you're already what he wants. And this is from the oldest to the youngest, from the front to the back, from the left to the right. Because age is not the great divider of, 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 of questions about where do I sit with God. I wish I could tell you the older that you got, the more confident in your identity and security that everybody, that it just comes with age. But it is not. Because I've met some 40, 50, 60, 7 year olds who are just as confused about who they are in God as some 12, 13, 14, and 20 year olds. It doesn't come with age, it comes by revelation. It comes by time spent with God and him telling you who you are. But here's the reality. We must understand this today, church, that God never relates to the false us. He cannot even deal with the false us. You want scripture for it? Grace, I'll tell you. If humility is a willingness to be known for who you really are, then pride and arrogance is the complete opposite. It's a willingness to be known for who you're not. 
It's an unwillingness to be known for who you really are. And let me tell you what God says. Everybody says, well, God welcomes everybody. Yes, he loves everybody, but he is very clear in the scriptures. He says, I resist the proud or those who are unwilling to be known for who they are, but I give grace to the humble. Ooh, doesn't that level the playing field? For the religious, it knocks you off your high horse. And for those who are, and those who, and those who like, don't, just don't feel like they're good enough, it elevates you. Our God, Jesus was an elevator of everyone who was downtrodden, amen? He always went to the least, and society said that they were nothing and trash. And Jesus said, come here, let me elevate you. He was a guy of honor. He was an honorable king and an honoring king. And in prayer, there's a certain honor that he bestows upon his sons and daughters and says, yep, you can come to me. It's the very thing that people in the Old Testament long to be able to do, to come into the presence of God. What? And we have access to him in the way of prayer. What? This would boggle their minds, you guys. So here's the thing, if you're going to, I believe that it's not too late. We're in 2020 and some of you are like, new year, new me. And it's like new year, old you, you know, and, and like just a different year, like the calendar turn, but nothing in you changed and nothing really was transformed in your life. And, I, and I'm telling you, our lives aren't changed because a day changes. Our lives are changed whenever we begin to behave, whenever we begin to choose some, to believe something different because we do what we do because we believe what we believe or don't believe. And I'm just telling you in 2020, it is not too late. We're only a second month in what if I told you that this could be your most victorious year to date and before you roll your eyes because you become cynical because you've sat for so long what if you actually believe that God's got something he wants to do in my family this year God's got something that he wants to do in my marriage this year that I have not seen him do in 22 years but as long as I got a pulse come on somebody I got a purpose and as long as there is still blood pulsating through this spot that means that there are some prayers that have yet to be prayed there are some requests that have yet to be made known to God and he's what here's what my pastor in Arizona an incredible man of God he would often say this we can't do it without God but God won't do it without us what if that were true? Or like another theologian says, I believe that God does nothing on earth except for answer prayer. Or a great church revivalist who said this, John Wesley, that, that you know what? God does nothing on earth except answer believing prayer. What if that were true? What if we believed that? We would probably pray with a little bit more chutzpah. We pray with a little bit more intentionality. We pray with a little bit more expectation, just a little bit. So no matter where you are in this journey, my job, my assignment this morning is to just move that needle, even if it's just a little. Like if we go from here to boop, it's a win in the kingdom. If we just go from here to boop, like my prayer life just went up, like, boop, 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 you know, and we, what we hope for is like the meter goes from here to like, whoa you know and, and God's like no I'm okay I'm okay if you're here I'm okay with you just whoop, just by the grace of God and I just wonder the compound effect because we are the church and the Bible says that one can put a thousand two but ten thousand and where two or three are gathered in my name and where any two of you touch and agree on anything according to my word and my will I wonder what could happen in this city I wonder what could happen in the high school across the way on the middle school or across the way the high school down the street I wonder what could happen in the community if God looked out and he found a faith-filled church and he found a church that collectively said we're going to just cry out to God together and we're going to pray with a little bit more frequency with a little bit more intentionality with just a little bit more expectation because we know that our God has never failed us so why would he fail us now <laughs> listen to me well you don't want to learn to pray in the middle of a crisis Ooh, anybody been there I mean can we just be honest <laughs> Where it's like, yeah, I learned to pray in the Christ, but I'm pretty sure God had a better way. <laughs> I 
I'm pretty sure I should have learned that before, but it's all good. Thank you, God, for grace. So that means on the mountaintops we pray. And in the middle of victories we pray. And when a diagnosis comes that is completely unexpected, we pray. And whenever crisis comes or someone dies or someone loses their job, our financial provision becomes overwhelming. We pray. And we have tough times and we pray because it's who we are. And we go to him about everything and all times and we cast our burdens on him. I am telling you, prayer is the great, it's the great level. It, it, prayer is the, it, it, see some of us who've been struggling, thank you Lord, with anxiety, even some of you struggling with even mental things and storms and battles where you feel like your brain just, you can't even shut it off to go to sleep at night. Some of you who have struggled with sleep and resting to the level that God has called you to rest, God says, if you'll pray, if you'll engage with me, there's an anointing, I am telling you, that he is releasing in this very moment, and it is access. Whenever God begins doing something, it is up, for, up to us as the people of God to respond and say, yes, Lord, that's my, thank you, God. Let it be, God. That's when we say amen, it's not just like, oh, cute little cheer. It's like, no, let it be in my life and in my family and in my community. I am telling you, there's an oil. The Bible refers to God as the balm in Gilead. And here's what I sense him doing. There's a balm, there's a healing balm that's beginning to flow right now where many in this particular service who have struggled with anxiety and struggle with these mental things and several of you even in nighttime seasons of terrors and you can't even go to sleep at night so you're not resting well and you're not able to be who God's called you to be to your family and on your job and in your relationships the Lord says no more no more because I am the God who fights for you and I'm the God who goes before you I am the God who levels every valley and brings down every mountain I am the God who is a voice behind you saying this is the way walk in it I am the God who makes crooked paths straight for you but it starts with you coming into my presence like never before what could 22 2020 look like if your prayer life just went to even just a just a couple steps with a little bit stronger of an intensity. There's some fathers in this room right now where the Lord says there are some walls that I am wanting to erect around your families and around your children if you'll just partner with me, if you'll just begin asking, if you'll just begin speaking and declaring. And you're gonna see some miracles this year. You're going to see some breakthroughs this year. There are some fathers who have been extremely ancient, anxious about the state of both your job and your children. And the Lord would say, if you'll just partner with me, there's some victories that you're going to see that were unexpected. That's what I sense him saying in this room this morning. Unexpected victories are coming your way if you'll just partner with me in the place of prayer. Every single prayer matters, even the ones that you've forgotten about. And there are some of you who prayed some prayers literally decades ago. I sense it so strongly. And the Lord would say, please remember that I am still the God that I told you that I was in scripture, just like I bottle up every tear Please know this, I collect every prayer and in due season and in my timing, I respond accordingly. If we would believe the word of the Lord, we pray a whole lot more. Because even the things that you've forgotten about in the next season, in this season, in this, in this new year, you're going to begin seeing some answers. And I just feel like some surprises are going to come the way of many in this house, particularly in this service, where God, your father, 
is going to begin surprising you. And in that moment when it happens, I'm telling you, you're going to be like, oh, I forgot that I asked the Lord for that. Oh, Jesus, I thought you didn't forget. Oh, you're not like me. Oh, you're not like man. You can oh, okay. You're God and I'm not. Okay, great. But it's going to be this cool revelation and this seemingly normal thing that God reveals in you, just telling you who he is. This is who our God is. Amen? So I need you to do three things for me. Number one, what do you want, what do you want from me, little preacher man? Here, here, here's what I want. Number one, really believe that God is good. I like really believe that he's good. Despite the challenges, despite the, despite the hardships of the worship team that come, really believe that's good. Number one, three things I want to challenge you in. Really believe that he's good. Number two, I need you to refuse to let go of God's promises. Oh, that's so much easier said than done. Right? I mean, can, do we have any honest Christians in the play? Any followers of Jesus? Because <laughs> I don't know about you, but the minute I step out to really stand on the promises of God, it's like, oh, God, are you, are you sure you said this? Because, <laughs> ooh, I don't know. I was giving the illustration. Somebody helped me out in the 8 a.m. service earlier. I, I get this picture and this image sometimes that particularly this morning, where holding on to the promises of God, you guys, it can be like, like at a rodeo, like whenever the guy's like, you know, the Broncos just like, you know, and you're just like, ah, you know, and, 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 and have you ever, I've never been to a rodeo, I've just seen it on TV, you know, because, you know, well, and so, and, and there are many of us there, okay, great, and breaking moles every day, happy Black History Month, and so, listen, but I've seen so many, and it's like, I'm like, oh, I would never, are you kidding me, and so, and, but, but it's kind of like, Sometimes being a faithful son or daughter of God, some seasons, is just about holding on. If you can just see some of us who've been in those seasons, I remember whenever we first got married, my wife was having just some female pains and, and problems, and she's literally on the floor, like crawling to, you know, in pain, like body writhing in pain. And I'm like, what can I do? It's the middle of the night, and she's just in intense pain. And to see her worship in the middle of the night and pray, and so sometimes holding on just looks like, but God, you said you're a healer. But God, you said by your stripes we are healed. But God, you said, see, some seasons are just about, I'm just gonna hold on to what God said. Come hell or high water, come ridicule, even if it makes me look a little bit foolish. If you've never looked a little bit foolish in the middle of what you're believing God for, I would probably challenge you to go a little bit deeper <laughs> and ask God what he's really saying. Because I think we can make a strong case that some of the things that God whispers into our ears, we're like, mm, I'll believe something lesser because that's going to make me look like an idiot. And, but some seasons are just about, I'm just gonna hold on. And, and for some of you, I know you've been holding on for some years. And some of you are a little bit newer and you've been holding on for some months, but it certainly feels like some years. I mean, it's been three weeks, Pastor Brandon. <laughs> but it certainly feels like it's been three decades where God made me a promise, or I read this promise in his word, and I'm not quite seeing it. I got this, just, impression early in the 8 a.m. service and I'm sensing the same thing in this service where some of you like that Bronco like you've been you've been tossed off of the promise and you fell on on the ground and it hurt like you had the wind knocked out of you and when those moments happen you've got two choices you can stay down or you can get back up again you can stay down and wallow in defeat, in, 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 in condemnation, in self-pity. 
I hear the Lord saying, the pity party's over. The pity party's over. See, he gives us a season to be pitiful. He does, because he's so good like that. And he knows that we are but dust, as the scriptures say. But some of you have been in your pity party for way too long. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning. Some of you have even lost people. And I believe in the grief cycle, but the Lord says it's, it's been, and I want to be careful because this isn't everybody. Like if you lost someone in the last month, I ain't talking to you. But, but there's God speaking to some, and it's like this pit of, like, ah, I can't. And the Lord says, I know, I know, I know, but you're still here. And I'm still here. And those other people are still here. And I need you to get up. And I need you to begin walking in your purpose in a greater level. Does that make sense, everyone? The Bible says weep with those who weep. So I'm not being brash. I'm really not. But we've been there. But there's some in this room where I hear the Lord in my spirit saying, pity party's over. You've got work to do. Because sometimes the greatest remedy for a pity party is a prompting of your purpose. And the Lord's saying, awaken to your purpose again. You're still here. There's people that need you. There's people that need your prayers. There's people that need to see your example of getting back up again. So to refuse to let go of God's promises for your life, no matter how many times you've been bucked up, mm -mm, I'm not letting go. And then finally, the third and final thing is this. I need you to resist discouragement and despair. And again, that's so much easier said than it is done. I want everyone to stand to their feet this morning. Here's the deal. Love, giving, whenever God gives us or speaks things to us, He speaks so that we respond to Him. And we can respond in the affirmative or the negative, but either way, we we're called to respond to Him. So here's what I want to do this morning. Every head bow, every eye close. Let every man, woman, boy, girl, lost, saved, far from God, really close to God, just examine your heart Psalm 139 24 25 search me God know my heart try me know my thoughts see if there be any way that doesn't line up with you in my life lead me in the right way I'm gonna give opportunity to respond this morning if you are here and you say gosh I that word about the wind being knocked out of me and the breath being knocked out of me that was for me. I want you to raise up your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. That's you. I just want to know who I'm preaching to this morning. Who did God send me to Iowa to preach to this morning? So many. Front, back. Okay, you can put your hands down. If you're here and you would say, gosh, 2020, I know that it's more than just preaching this morning. I feel like this is a prophetic message that God is inviting me into my prayer life going to another level and my answer to that is yes if that's you on the count of three I want you to lift up your hand one two three yeah so many across the room all right and then thirdly and this is the more this is the more vulnerable one this is the more gosh I'm willing to be known for who I really am if you're here and you say gosh that word about self-pity and I've just sat here for far too long and I feel the hand of God lifting me up even in this moment, though it's painful. I want you to lift your hand up on the count of three. God's got something special for you. One, two, three. Oh, so many. Yeah. Yeah. In that third group, I want you to keep your hand up. Father, I thank you for the healing balm of Gilead flowing now. Father, I declare that the son of righteousness 
is arising with healing in his wings. And I thank you that the place of despair is not their destiny. And I ask of you now that you would begin releasing your anointing to bring them to a place of full healing. That your word over their life is healed and a whole in the name of Jesus that they are not just a part but God you are filling in every gap and every space now in the name of Jesus I declare a victorious situation I declare that confidence is rising on the inside of them again and Lord, I thank you for every tear that has been cried, that not one has been wasted, but you've collected everyone, that not one prayer has been wasted, but even now you're making good on your promises. You care. Jehovah Rapha. Oh, I am the Lord that heals you. I hear the Lord saying, my blood still works. My word still works. I am still the all-sufficient one. I am still the one that completes, that fills in every hole, every cave in your heart, being filled in now in the name of Jesus Christ. You're not insufficient. Oh, you're not insufficient for the all-sufficient one lives on the inside of you. He says, I've never left you, not once. Oh, not once. Not for one moment were you forsaken. So what I want us to do, we're going to end in a way of just prayer this morning. If you raised your hand for those first two, if your hand went up, here's what I want us to do. I've asked the worship team to begin declaring what I believe to be a prophetic declaration. And that's how we're going to kind of close this segment of our service. And I want to pray and, 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 and declare some things over you. But if you lifted your hand for the first or second call, or even the third one, I just want you to step out from where you are and just come and meet me at this altar. Because we're going to begin to just activate. I'm going to ask the Lord for just an, an impartation, a stirring. There's a spirit of prayer that God wants to release even now. This morning. Come on, move quickly, and then just come to this altar and lift up your hands. And old, young, uh, uh, doesn't matter how long you've walked with the Lord. May we never become so, so used to God that we, that we, well, that's for somebody else. No! I want everything that God has for me with your hands lifted. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus Christ that the very spirit of prayer, those who, who said this morning, yeah, I know, this is a prophetic call what I feel like is that this is a prophetic word that's pulling you from a place of complacency that's pulling you out of apathy and that's releasing you into the river of praying with greater expectation this year Holy Spirit begin anointing right now up and down every aisle flood this altar Holy Spirit I pray for a fresh anointing a renewed anointing God I thank you that those who've been discouraged in the place of prayer would know that they've been given great victory oh Jesus